Hi, afternoon, everyone. I hope you had good uh, lunch break and uh, side events. I'm Lucy Pinches, project manager of the Mine Action Review, which is an independent project that provides global monitoring and analysis of survey and clearance efforts for anti-personnel mines and cluster munition remnants. Um, it's my pleasure today to moderate and to welcome you to plenary session two on mine action, climate and the environment. And I'm delighted to introduce a fantastic panel. We have um, in the order of presenters, Ms. Christine Hong Olmbrustad, for a senior advisor on climate and environment with MPA. And Christine's going to be presenting on behalf of the environmental issues in mine action working group. We have Karen Chandler, Director of the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement in the US State Department, who's going to provide an overview of the State Department's increasing focus on the role of conventional weapons destruction programs in fostering climate resilience and food security. We have Mr. Sas Sasha uh, Bradovich, Director of Bosnia and Herzegovina Mine Action Center, and Sasha is going to be providing some of the considerations in Bosnia and Herzegovina from the National Authority perspective. And last but not least, Abigail Hartley, Chief of Policy Advocacy, Donor Relations and Outreach for UNMAS, who's going to be providing some examples of impacts of explosive ordnance contamination and climate change and efforts being taken in the mine action sector. So I would like to say a few words before handing over to our panelists. Firstly, thank you to UNMAS and to Geneva Centre for putting this very important topic on the agenda of the NDM. I think this topic really follows on very well from this morning's plenary session on displaced persons. And it's just one of the many ways in which climate and environment intersects with several key topics uh, pertinent to mine action. There was actually a panel on the environment in 2020, which was the NDM just before COVID-19 hit and uh, kind of changed, changed our world. Um, and in the intervening three years, the topic has really started gaining momentum and stakeholders are really starting to better understand the many ways in which mine action sector must integrate climate and environment into every aspect of our work. And it's also a very timely session where in a climate and biodiversity crisis and many conflict affected countries are located in areas considered the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And at the same time, many conflicts have occurred in some of the world's richest places for biodiversity. So I wanted actually to highlight um, the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report for 2023, and that contains a global risk perception survey based on responses from over 1,200 experts from across academia, business, governments, the international community and civil society. And the responses from that survey for 2022-2023 were collected from the 7th of September to the 5th of October 2022. And they term a global risk as an event or condition that could negatively impact a significant proportion of global gross domestic product, population or natural resources. Next slide, please. So here we have the findings of that risk report. And you can see in the short term, five out of 10 of the short term risks and six out of 10 of the long term risks are connected to the environment or climate change which I think shows the importance of this topic. Um, and it's also timely as next year, the Antipersonal Mine Ban Convention community will be adopting a five-year action plan for the convention uh, under Cambodia's presidency of the Fifth Review Conference. And state parties will need to consider how they incorporate climate and the environment considerations into that action plan, something which was presented uh, earlier at the intersessionals meeting at that panel session. And then lastly, it's also timely as IMAS 713 on environmental issues in mine action is being updated to reflect the latest understanding of the topic and best practice in our sector. The current IMAS 713 was published in 2017 and um, only has one small reference to climate change. 
The IMAS that's currently being updated, will hope, um, which will hopefully be adopted towards the end of this year, will include several aspects of climate change and hopefully also a technical note on mine action to support implementation of IMAS. So now I'll pass over to my panellists, um, happy to pass over to Christine first. Thank you, and thank you to the organizers for setting environment and climate on the agenda during the NDM. Next slide, please. I'm speaking on behalf of the EMA Working Group, which was established in 2020 and where NPA is a member and a co-chair together with CEOPS. You can see the members here on the slide, and we meet online every two months to meet with different environmental experts, discuss and share best practices. We also have a brand new website. Uh, the address is on the slide and you can register for the next meeting that is actually next week or become a new member or both at the website. Next slide, please. This photo is from Ukraine and the flooding from destruction of the dam in the Kherson region. And we have all too sadly seen the devastating impact, including the potential large scale shift of mines and displacement of thousands of people. And this was a man-made disaster and unpredictable, but we do have the opportunity to predict the risks and impact of climate change and what that means for contaminated areas, such as the Mekong River in Southeast Asia, if that floods, to make sure that we plan better for the future. Next slide, please. As we have a triple crisis of climate change, biodiversity and pollution in the world today, we as the Mine Action community need to step up the work to reduce our impact from the mine action activities on the environment and contribute to sustainable development. And today I will look at some of the environmental impacts and what can be done and lay out some existing initiatives from our members that is trying to respond to these issues. Next slide, please. There is, of course, the direct impact of the explosive ordinance on the environment, but I'm not going into details of this today. I just wanted to make you aware of this issue. So next slide, please. And it's not a choice for clearance operators if we want to work on the environment, but it's a responsibility in line with the do no harm principle. This means that we should reduce our impact from activities like limiting vegetation cutting or the use of mechanical assets. And a lot of these measures are included in the current IMAS 713, but with the revised IMAS and with climate change happening, we should take environmental and climate considerations even more into account as many of the countries we are working in are becoming even more vulnerable to climate change and will experience more of the consequences in the future, such as flooding, desertification, or drought. And by following the land release principles as set by the IMA 711, the areas processed can be minimized, helping to reduce the associated environmental impacts by focusing activities where they are needed. We also need to make sure that we do environmental assessments to understand the climate risks and the environmental context in the areas we are working in. And uh, in NPA, we are rolling out a green assessment tool that supports our programs in doing so by having an environmental screening and look at the potential climate risks in the areas we work in and systematically assess the risks from our land release activities and sets out mitigation measures to be taken. In addition to limiting the impact from our activities, we should also look at our organizational footprint. And I would encourage all the organizations there today to sign the ICRC Climate and Environment Charter to commit to reduce climate emissions and develop targets and action plans. And in order to set targets, we have to measure our impact. And this year, the ICRC also launched a carbon calculator to assist organizations to do so by measure and reducing their footprint. And in addition, we have to green our procurement, uh, look at our energy use and reduce the waste we generate. And I will give some examples of that now. 
This photo is from one of Hale Trust demining camps in Zimbabwe, where solar panels provides them with more sustainable and consistent power. And Halo is establishing solar energy as its primary source in many of their programs and offices. And this is also something other clearance operators are doing. And green solutions are not necessarily more expensive. NPA in Lebanon found that one year after investing in solar energy for their office in South Lebanon, the initial investment was paid off and they were actually saving money and the environment. So instead of looking mainly at the one-time investment cost in solar energy, for instance, we should also in the future more consider the life cycle costs of products as well. Another huge problem is waste management and the lack of it in many countries, which often results in that the waste is dumped, burned or bur buried. And uh, in Lao PDR, NPA has been working with Zero Waste Laos a local partner to improve the waste management by reducing our waste as much as with 60% from the office that is going to the landfill by composting and by recycling metals, plastic and glass that are used by local small businesses. And the ICRC also to reduce their plastic use, they have a project to replace their plastic bags that they use to staple food in with more sustainable ones as the plastic bags at their end of life use are either burned or dumped, which is a major risk of pollution. One of our main objective in the mine action sector is to deliver a safe land to the communities in affected states. But we also need to think about how we can contribute to safe and sustainable land use and use after clearance. In NPA Vietnam, the program has integrated climate change considerations in their non-technical survey funded by the PMWRA, asking the communities questions related to climate change, like if they have experienced any changes to the weather and what kind of needs and expectations they have to post clearance land use. And information that mine action operators collect during survey and clearance can support further post clearance land use and other actors and the national authorities in planning for more sustainable use of land as well. And then I would like to highlight a few practical examples of this. In Angola, Halo Trust is working on land high in biodiversity that is vulnerable to unsustainable land use practices. Like this picture, it shows burning on one side of the river caused by man-made fires in the high biodiversity area. Halo is working with two partners to support wider conservation efforts, such as survey of tree species degradation and petland loss in the region. And interestingly, by working with the mine action organization that has a high community trust and the access, their partner also experienced that they progress much faster in their work than they would have by themselves. In Tanzania, Apopo with a partner are working with a partner to plant trees and providing climate smart solutions to agriculture and local farmers. And they are scaling up these projects in other countries as well in the region. And right now they have established nine syntropic farms in Tanzania, Ethiopia, and in Zimbabwe. Next slide, please. Mangroves protects the coastline and is critical for the natural habitats. And in El Salvador, that has seen a 60% reduction in their mangrove forests since the 1950s, HALO has been working in partnership with the local mangrove organization, restoration organization. And in addition to planting new mangroves, the project is working on more longer-term community engagement in protecting the mangroves. Next slide. Yeah. And lastly, there are some challenges and opportunities, but I think we can come back to them during the Q&A later, but I just want to highlight one of them, one of the opportunities, because many countries are now writing the national adaptation plans to be submitted to the UN framework Convention on Climate Change, and affected countries should make sure to include mine action in their national adaptation plans to ensure that mine action prior priorities properly align with expected climate adaptation needs. And this is also valid for countries' disaster reduction plans as well. Next slide, please. 
So just to summarize, I strongly believe that integrating climate and environment into mine action work will improve the quality and the impact of our work. And if you want to check out the new website, join on, uh, our online meeting next week uh, to the EMA working group or become a member, please follow the link on this slide as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristin. I think that was a, a great overview of uh, the considerations that we're thinking about within uh, Mine Action. And I'll pass straight over to you, Karen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, uh, good afternoon. And thank you for inviting me to join this very important conversation. And this is a timely and very relevant topic. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. I'm gonna to talk about three different things basically how we see the situation within the US government, what we are doing, and of course, the challenges that we see ahead. As we know, climate change is one of the biggest challenges facing our planet today. It is causing more frequent and severe natural disasters such as floods, droughts, and storms, and these are affecting millions of people around the world. Changing weather and climate variability, including severe weather events, can impact mine operations directly or indirectly. In Southeast Asia, for example, heavier rainy seasons can result in increased landslides that expose long buried unexploded ordnance and devastating floods that slow clearance work. For Pacific Island nations, rising sea levels can force states to reprioritize clearance areas when communities are displaced and forced to use contaminated land that they were previously able to avoid. At the same time, Landmines and other explosive remnants of war continue to pose a serious threat to the safety and well being of communities in many countries. Not only do they cause physical harm to individuals, but they prevent communities from accessing essential resources such as water, food, and shelter. By clearing landmines and other explosive remnants of war, we can create safe and secure environments for communities to live and work in. This, in turn, can help promote climate resiliency by enabling people to access and manage natural resources more effectively. For example, by removing landmines from agricultural land, farmers can cultivate crops more efficiently and sustainably, which can help them adapt to changing weather conditions, select more resilient crop types, and reduce their vulnerability to climate-related events. Similarly, by clearing landmines from water sources, Communities can access safely managed sources of drinking water, which is essential for their health and well being. In addition, humanitarian mine action can also help build the capacity of local communities to respond to natural disasters. By providing mine risk education and supporting emergency response, we can help them recognize hazards that may emerge after disaster and to recover more quickly. I want to stress that the United States takes these issues very seriously and is working to integrate climate considerations across our foreign policy, development, and humanitarian work. As a leader in global landmine clearance and conventional weapons destruction, the United States has invested more than $4.6 billion in more than 120 countries since 1993. In fiscal year 2022, the United States supported conventional weapons destruction activities in more than 65 countries and areas with more than $376 million. We are increasingly focused on how our conventional weapons destruction programs can help foster climate resilience and food security in communities affected by explosive hazards. We aim to leverage our humanitarian demining programs to promote conservation and increase climate resiliency. In Ukraine, Russia's unlawful war and full-scale invasion has littered massive swaths of the country with landmines, unexploded ordnance, and improvised explosive devices. These explosive hazards are exacerbating food insecurity by blocking access to farmland and impeding restoration of damaged agricultural storage and processing facilities. These impediments ultimately limit the amount of food that Ukraine can produce and provide to food insecure communities in Ukraine and across the globe, including many unable to grow their own crops due to the impacts of climate change. The United States has committed more than $91.5 million this year to help the government of Ukraine address this urgent humanitarian challenge. 
ensuring the safe return of displaced people and getting Ukraine's farmland back to productive use are priorities supported across the entire US government. In Iraq, landmines, improvised devices, and other explosive remnants of war block the development of infrastructure to deliver safe drinking water to cities and villages. As localized water sources become less reliable, developing safe water infrastructure becomes urgent. Conventional weapons destruction efforts continue to clear the way for the delivery of safe water to hundreds of thousands of Iraqi citizens. Humanitarian demining can also play an integral role in helping partner countries to achieve their own conservation and ecotourism goals. For example, Angola is home to the headwaters of the Okavanga Delta in the province of Kwando Kubango, an ecologically sensitive area that is home to a diverse array of plants and wildlife. The government of Angola seeks to protect this area to allow for the safe migration of elephants and other animals from Angola down to Botswana, where the river officially ends. Demining the Okavanga headwaters will enable Angola to protect this region for future generations. This conservation effort is the centerpiece of Angola's plan to expand its ecotourism industry as part of a broader strategy to move away from near total economic reliance on oil production and towards sustainable revenue sources. Let me take a few minutes to also describe what we are doing. The United States is examining how we can help improve our environmental outcomes of mine clearance operations across all our programs. As such, we are aware of a variety of initiatives across the mine action community that are aimed at taking practical steps, several of which we are already directly supporting. In order to better understand the scope of the contribution that mine action can make to supporting communities impacted by climate change and their resilience to these changes, we are working with the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining, or GICHD, to study the relationship between humanitarian demining assistance and climate resilience. The GICHD study on mine action, resilience, and climate change will explore case studies ongoing in Colombia, Kosovo, Somaliland, Tajikistan, and Vietnam, and aims to identify and analyze the links between mine action activities and the resilience of communities to climate change, as well as additional ways that mine action stakeholders can enhance such, such resilience. This study is expected to be completed by the end of 2023. The International Mine Action Standards Review Board is updating their environmental standard to ensure demining operators consider climate change and other environmental factors when planning and undertaking clearance operations. As an IMAS Review Board member, we are participating in this process, which is expected to conclude at the end of 2023. In the Asia Pacific region, many of our projects support climate change resiliency in agriculture and help address explosive threats impacted by climate change. For example, in 2022, with US funding, Norwegian People's Aid collaborated with Zero Waste Laos, a youth-led volunteer organization to coordinate a countrywide tree planting initiative with UXO clearance work. In total, with additional support from the European Union, Zero Waste Laos planted and distributed 8,200 fruit trees to schools throughout Laos. It is also important to consider the impact mine clearance operations themselves can have on the environment. Clearance operations themselves can cause damage to the environment. Just yesterday, I was discussing with the Ukrainian delegation their concerns about the clearance of all the farmland in Ukraine, perhaps impacting the soil and the, the quality of the soil, which would impact future agricultural growth. While intense clearance work is necessary to remove the threat, there are steps that national authorities and mine action operators can take to reduce the negative impacts of operations on the environment and climate. These factors should be incorporated in the updated version of the IMAS action and the environment. Land release uh, procedures that rely on non-technical and technical survey to better define contaminated areas reduce the amount of land that will be subject to full clearance operations, which could damage the environment. Our implementing partners are assessing how their operations impact the environment. 
For example, they are studying the carbon footprint of their camps, their vehicles, and related transportation schedules and working to reduce that footprint. Some are also weighing the environmental impact of scrap metal disposal in physical security and stockpile management programs. And now to the challenges of environmental mainstreaming in mine action. One of the challenges to environmental mainstreaming in mine action is that the mine action sector does not hold expertise on long-term climate impacts yet. Another challenge is that the mine action sector does not control the post-clearance use of land made safe through mine action. Full environmental mainstreaming involves national mine action authorities coordinating with local and regional governments in affected states to implement policies that support national and local climate adaptation and resilience objectives. Affected states can consider how mine action operations can help communities adapt and support climate resilience when they plan for post-clearance land use. Mine action operations can help states learn more about climate variability in impacting the community and potentially provide information to assist in planning for more climate resilience in communities impacted by climate change. We often emphasize the importance of building national capacity in humanitarian mine action and that over the long term, mine action is more sustainable and effective when it is nationally owned and managed. This relates to environmental mainstreaming in that recipients countries need to have the political will to devote funding to develop national capacity, as well as to plan for and follow through on objectives that support climate resilience. If national and local authorities consider supporting climate adaptation and resilience for close clearance land use, they will be better able to support the long term needs of the population. For example, we recently learned that in the West Bank, a completed clearance project has enabled the construction of a solar plant. We encourage national and local authorities to consider the environmental impacts as they prioritize clearance tasks and support close clearance use and development. We need to have a collective mine action vision. Effective survey and clearance operations should incorporate robust community liaison efforts to ensure that the needs of the community are taken into account. Any support that mine action provides on climate resilience should similarly be centered on national and local communities. Changing weather and climate variability brings different challenges to different communities. Such an approach will help address some of the challenges for environmental mainstreaming in mine action, especially as it relates to community needs and long-term plans for post-clearance use. We are providing support to pilot a survey methodology that incorporates questions about climate into non-technical survey in Way, Vietnam. The project, led by Norwegian People's Aid, aims to gather key information during community liaison meetings about how weather variability and climate change have affected local lives and land use and to identify any measures to mitigate climate change already in place. This information can then be used to inform the design of any future mine action operation and be shared with local and national authorities to support their efforts to combat climate change and build more sustainable and resilient communities. To conclude, humanitarian mine action has a vital role to play in promoting climate resilience. By creating a safe and secure environment for communities to live and work in, we can help them adapt to the challenges of climate change and to build a more sustainable and resilient future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And I think it's uh, incredibly positive to have uh, the, the biggest donor to the sector really talk to this topic and give such a selection of great examples from across uh, the portfolio of countries that PMWRA supports. Um, and you touch on some really interesting ones, um, including uh, the consideration about soil health in Ukraine. And actually within the environmental issues in working group, uh, we had a expert presenter, a soil expert present on that exact topic. So just to flag to people, all of the expert presenters that have um, presented to that group, it's available on the website that Kristen said. But yeah, in terms of... Uh, food security, reducing vulnerabilities. And we also really uh, look forward to the results of that uh, GICHD study when they come out. So passing over to Sasha from BHMAT. Thanks, Sasha. 
Thank you, Lucy. Ladies and gentlemen, attendance this plenary is also a, a clear indication that the mine action sector is taking every mind safely, seriously, and the important issue needs to be considered, including the next five years action plan of the Anti-Personal Mine Bank Convention. Preparing, preparing myself on this plenary, I confirmed how landmines and other explosive remnants of war, casual lands on the soil degradation, loss of bioverging and se uh, several limits of the agriculture pr productive. Yet the quickest and most effective methods of the elimination of the landmines and other explosive remnants of war can sometimes result is highly deplored situation. Lands once are able uh, can become infallible and will provide much needed agriculture resource. All those motiva motivated by the best uh, intention, uh, carty action may uh, until provide the, the more, far more, and mo uh, number of landmines could be. Most national authorities is concerned dealing with the landmines and AOV have not yet introduced uh, national standards to incorporation, environment management, many and many of the countries also do not always have strong environmental legislative or governments in place. Bosnia and Herzegovina is one of the countries affected a major mine problem. The current suspected hazard area in Bosnia and Herzegovina is amount to 858 square kilometers regarding 1.67% of the territorial uh, total country size. In the post-war period, there are, we have uh, 1,078 uh, 1, victims out of the which 6,024 deadly. 134 the miners were injured during field operation. 53 of the head died. Since the beginning of the, the mining operation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there are of the 3,328 square kilometers has been returned on the safe us. National standards in Bosnia and Herzegovina do not have special prov uh, provides on the environmental protection. However, the existing procedures on measure of the humanitarian mining method of removing vegetation, removing metal and the waste using machine and extra continue to be management and the protect of the environment. In current cases, we modified the application of procedures in order to protect the environment without to paradise the quality of the clearance area on the safety of personal individual in the mining operation and user to area or nor dimly trust in entry process of human the mining. All metal found in the work path is the deposit in the special place on the collecting metals was. We communicated with the local population over the land in case of the need for mach ma machinal preparation of the land. For the most part, in order to pre uh, preserve the ve vegetation, we uh, avoid machine soil preparing to on uh, Monte pastures, also in the order uh, to preserve it, the national irrig uh, irrig irrigation of the soil. We avoid using threat machine to disable the soil deeper the 20 centimeters. In order to pr uh, preserve shielding of natural affairs, uh, affairs session of communication with the local community, competent forest farms regarding the removal of vegetation. Vegetation reward for work parts of the form boxes in area, area need in the order for free up space uh, for uh, resistance of vegetation. Open completion of the work, all trash on the work marking, including nine steps, must be removed for the task. In the average assessment in made of the uh, assemble of the risk for the relocated of mines on ARV, the fine assist the despoid decision polygons for destruction. Bosnia Herzegovina Mine Action Center uh, write the farm framework of this method 
pay special uh, attention to clear areas with the most important natural resource that cannot be used due to uh, existence for mine hazard. As on of the exp uh, explains other uh, MSA projects and uh, National Park Una in the municipality of the Bihać, Una River National Park, this area represents until national uh, entity is uh, part of Europe evolution for preservation of the overall biologic diversity. After, uh, after the Mai flooded in Bosnia and Herzegovina 2014, with cooperation with Belgian Royal Military Academy, we are used to map the area, removal uh, survey suspected hazard area sites and the fixed unexploded ordnance from the war disposed by flooded and landslides. On the base of the important re received mines and ARV, we are removed from flooded and uh, landslides affected area that were not provided suspected of thieving mines. Based on the experience, gender, its communication of the acti activities, we have achieved uh, full cooperation with local community regarding the priority so uh, solution of the problem in suspected hazard area with high risk of flooded and landslides. For example, in the municipality Donis Vilay and the Novi Grad, along the border with Croatia and Sava River, very close the uh, road, mine contamination, be it flooded protection and safe mobility difficultly. Contamination also uh, resp uh, responsible and obligated land access from purpose on the under, uh, uh, under taking fluid Revise measures. Several dating classes passed tried so uh, so science phase of MSA and tried rehabilitation is explaining important to provide future flooded in area. Uh, thanks to clearance, uh, that channel could also be accessed the continued to north south transport corridor 5C. This is the first major hide in Bost highway in Bosnia connecting of countries with Croatia and also service of flooded protection barrier. Bosnia and Herzegovina is affected uh, every year by forest fires, which are particular uh, certainly uh, south and southwest. In the mine suspected location, fire, uh, fire, uh, ter firefighters are not able to provide safe uh, access from uh, XD, uh, uh, that uh, that region, which lands and science element economic damage. For social, economic, and ecologic reason, we are touch great important to mine clearing of uh, the land in the forest area. For this reason, in the winter period, the mining capacity are the directly to employment of the mine operation in the south area on Bosnia and Herzegovina. International cons uh, consultation regarding international standards are currently underway with AIM forensing in the current IMAS and apply good uh, uh, practice. On complete the active on the draft of the measure chapter after the revision IMAS 0713 is adopted, we'll try to uh, draft special provides on environment protection. Agenda 2030 say is plan of, of action of people to planet and pro, uh, preserve. We are this, uh, resolved to free human race from tire poverty distance and event we hold and security on the planet. Bosnia and Herzegovina has recognized the importance uh, potential for implementation of Agenda 2030 as operation significant impact social, economic and uh, environmental aspects of life with uh, the current and the uh, age region cooperation. In there of mine action for pro, pro, uh, pros perspective contribute of mine action or relative su sustainable development goals are on following. Environmental sensing mine clearance contributed on the protect and uh, safety of country and national 
heritage, safe access or provide denied natural resource enabled from sustainable and efficient management and use, environmentally sensitive under clearance resource degradation aquatic uh, ecosystem and support the health and sustainable use. Environmental sensitive mine clearance contributed on uh, conversation, restore and submit manage biodiversity terrestrial economic system. In this year, Bosnia and Herzegovina is planning to work on the national mine uh, action strategy revision and environmental will be incorporated with this never adopted document. We are recognizing Bosnia and Herzegovina has responsibility on the maintain, uh, maintain and advise airmen safely on uh, national and international level. Uh, consideration the Bosnia and Herzegovina Mine National Center is recognizing international and such is capably provide assistance on the countries in the area of the, the mining, knowledge, technology, experts, education. I look forward to discuss this important issue with other participants on this panel and other here present as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. I think that was a really interesting kind of snapshot of uh, what is happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina, hearing about the flooding and the importance of flood defence, the impact of uh, forest fires, of course, contamination starting them, but also hindering efforts. Um, in terms of like national mine action standards, that's something that we're really hearing as a, as a sector. Um, very few countries currently have specific ones for the environment, but hopefully with this new IMAS update, that'll be a perfect opportunity for states to incorporate in. Um, and great to hear that Bosnia is thinking about um, incorporating it into the national strategy, which is also good to hear. So I'll pass over to our final panelist, Abigail, thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and uh, uh, Excellencies, colleagues and friends. It's really good to be on this panel um, with such uh, knowledgeable colleagues, and I'm glad that we're discussing this. I think it could have been the Secretary General saying that if we don't care about the climate problem, we don't really need to worry about any of the other problems. So um, it's really an important issue. So I'm going to just touch on three main points, first being the impact of explosive ordnance on the environment. The second thing, the impact of climate change on mine action operators' efforts to protect civilians. And three, the efforts that we're making to ensure that the mine action sector can take all feasible measures to protect the environment um, as we're going about our business. So, of course, we all know that mine clearance um, removes the explosive ordnance from the ground and reduces a lethal threat to um, the lives of civilians and makes land available for civilian use. Um, UNMAS is engaged in 20 field locations at the request of the Security Council and resident and humanitarian coordinators around the world. So... It, it is the case that mine action protects civilians, promotes socioeconomic recovery and development, but until explosive ordnance contamination is cleared, it does have a negative impact on the environment. Over time, explosive ordnance degrades, casings corrode, toxic chemicals and heavy metals leak into the soil and groundwater. And this degradation eventually threatens the health of humans, animals, and flora. Ecosystems are impacted and become endangered. A report from the UN's Environmental Protection Agency, UNEP, in February 2023, noted also that by denying access to land, water sources, and other natural resources, the presence of ERW can put increased pressure on the land nearby that is, is not contaminated, um, resulting in unsustainable natural resource management in contaminated communities. Um, my colleagues have mentioned Ukraine. Um, Karen was talking about that. And in his report on protection of civilians, the Secretary General did stress that Ukraine is not only facing the physical threat of landmines and other explosive hazards, but the destruction of forests, soil contamination by heavy metals and poison leaks, as well as fuel and toxic chemical polluted groundwater. And there was a comment in a newspaper about the war in Ukraine really being 
um, literally a toxic, um, a toxic war. So that is, I mean, concluding my first point that the explosive ordnance does have a big impact on the environment. I now want to just talk a little bit about climate change and the impact that climate change is having on our and all of your efforts to um, remove explosive ordnance. Um, the Under Secretary General for, Police, for Peacekeeping was noting in his last report to the Security Council that climate change is challenging and profoundly impacting the ability of UN peace operations to implement their mandates. Um, this ranges from extreme weather events to dwindling resources that fuel conflict. Climate related risks are only set to heighten and further threaten peace and security. Of the 16 countries that are most climate vulnerable, nine of them host a UN field mission, these being Afghanistan, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Haiti, Mali, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, and Yemen. And of course, you in the room will have heard those countries, and as you well know, um, at least seven of those are also impacted by explosive, explosive ordnance contamination. So the, what we see, for example, the severe flooding in Yemen caused the migration of mines, and in some cases the water was strong enough to move large and heavy anti-vehicle mines along quite long distances, creating new hazards for local civilian populations. And of course, we've just had the terrible news from the 6th of June of the Kakovka Dam in Ukraine and the huge impact that that has had. Um, from my own experience, I was in Sri Lanka in the time of the tsunami, and we saw there were lots of um, Sri Lankan army bases along the coastline with very neatly regulated minefields protecting them. And when the wave basically washed um, into many of the coastal areas of Sri Lanka, those mines were just spread totally randomly. And for those operators in the room who know that uh, methodically laid minefields are easy to clear, mines spread across flood debris um, are not easy to clear. So I have my own personal experience of that. Um, in Somalia, the worst drought of 40 years, um, we're hearing about that in East Africa in the Horn, has triggered increased population displacement, including among communities living in known hazardous areas and migrations occurring into contaminated lands, putting people further at risk. In other mission contexts, in Abye, flooding has co caused by consecutive rainy seasons. In Abye, the rainy seasons have become heavier and longer, which gives us a shorter window of time for us to be able to carry out um, mine clearance operations and also, of course, hampering access. I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room who has been stuck in a Toyota in mud um, all around the world. And then also, um, recalling Rakhine State in northeast Myanmar, where Cyclone Mokka and related flooding left a trail of devastation, adding to the fear of floating mines um, and explosive remnants of war. So as we heard uh, Special Advisor Robert Piper this morning, um, and as confirmed in recent UNHCR reporting, the unexpected scale of displacement puts many millions of vulnerable people at higher risk of being exposed to explosive ordnance as they move into often unfamiliar and uncharted territory. So we've had to adapt our approach to this, to explosive EORE, explosive ordnance risk education, for possible exposure to new hazards. So in the face of these challenges, mine action operators, we have to adapt our response and our methods to ensure that our work doesn't contribute to environmental degradation. Um, and while the vast majority of ground that has been subject to um, mechanical explosive ordnance clearance is now fully productive, such clearance activities themselves may generate amounts of waste um, in the and vegetarian in the process of uh, vegetation removal in the process of mechanical demining. And it does, uh, thinking about this, I was a long time ago working in South Sudan and we were doing a bulk demolition. So it was all uh, to uh, proper standards and we were far away from the, the UXO was buried and there were uh, sandbags over the top and we were probably at 800 meters away. 
And it was amazing. I mean, the, we pressed the button, you could feel the shock wave. And I was sitting with some colleagues kind of under a tree and suddenly it's this noise and every leaf from the trees around me was just ripped off by the shock wave. I mean, I was really amazed and never would have thought that I would see something like that. So even destroying um, UXO can have that impact. Um, so I'm really glad to say people have mentioned IMAS um, as a custodian of the international standards. And yesterday I was chairing the review board with many of you there, we were talking about the new standard. Um, so UNMAS is very, very pleased. NPA is the uh, technical working group. I can see Rob White sitting there. Um, so we're really grateful that this standard is being looked at to introduce even more safeguards. And Kristin, oh, somebody mentioned the technical note. We've agreed that the technical note, which basically explains how to implement the standard will be issued and approved by the IMAS. Um, at the same time. Um, so the revised standard will have minimum requirements for environmental management. Um, it will lay out the responsibilities of national mine action authorities and mine action operators to ensure that the environment is not degraded by mine action work and that we return the land um, in the same state uh, as before, before we started clearance. The standard also considers climate risks and the need for mine action programs to adapt to meet the challenges of um, climate change and provides guidance on how to support climate resilience of communities, as well as to make sure that they that mine action operations are compliant with national legislation on the environment. Um, integrating climate considerations across our work in the mine action sector will strengthen our ability to implement our mandates. And uh, just to finish with a, a, a good UN official, to finish with a quote from the UN Secretary General, um, he said to the press last Thursday, after meeting with a group of civil society climate leaders, there is too much at risk for us to sit on the sidelines. Now must be the time for ambition and action. Thank you. Thanks, Abigail. And yeah, that's uh, very strong words to end that uh, presentation on and I uh, couldn't agree more. And it's very interesting to hear all of the examples from different regions across the world and actually how many um, affected states are actually already being impacted by some of the effects of climate change and the need to, to plan the adaptation for that. So we still have some time uh, for questions. Um, and questions from the floor, but also we welcome any examples that affected states or, or donors in the room might have for how they're um, addressing this issue um, or their experience of it, um, or questions for the panel. So I think I can see Serbia. Thank you, Lucy, for giving me the floor. First of all, uh, on behalf of the Serbia delegation, I would like to uh, commend the work of all the panelists and thank them uh, for their comprehensive uh, presentations. Uh, thank you for uh, providing this opportunity to shed some light on uh, one of the examples uh, uh, of uh, how uh, environment and mine action are uh, closely interwoven. Uh, namely, we in uh, uh, Serbian Mine Action Center have been uh, uh, strongly uh, committed to uh, taking environmental aspects into consideration ever since the foundation of our center. And uh, of course, to minimizing uh, potential harm from demining uh, uh, operations. And uh, uh, in um, uh, our policy is to uh, require from each of demining operators to uh, uh, list in their execution plan uh, and environmental plan, along with a fire protection plan and uh, safety at work uh, uh, plan. And there was a, a very uh, specific uh, example uh, during uh, the conduct of uh, cluster munitions uh, removal operations in the National Park of uh, Kopaonik, uh, uh, 
uh, when um, a special regime uh, was uh, required to uh, protect uh, uh, native trees and uh, uh, rare endemic uh, species, uh, namely uh, the chopping down of, uh, of uh, trees, uh, cutting of uh, tree branches, uh, blueberries and juniper uh, uh, bushes, uh, uh, were only possible to be cut uh, uh, in justified cases and uh, after uh, obtaining uh, uh, consent from uh, relevant uh, authorities. So thank you very much for, for this uh, opportunity to uh, share with you uh, and to say that uh, this topic is very uh, uh, important and uh, it's uh, great to have this uh, uh, on the agenda uh, also uh, because we had this uh, yesterday and the day before. I think this, that we should keep up with uh, with this uh, practice on, on uh, uh, other meetings as well. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you very much. It's great to hear that example, a very practical example from uh, Serbia of your efforts to protect the environment and take into account those endemic species, for example, in that specific case. I can see a United Kingdom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lucy, and thank you to all the panelists for an amazing, really, really, really interesting session. I think I can all agree that we, we learned a lot from it. Um, I am just um, asking from a, from a donor perspective, you know, the, the UK government places the very highest priority on climate protection um, throughout all our programming and that extends to our demining efforts. What can we do as an individual donor and as a group of donors collectively to help ensure that, you know, environmental principles, environmental protection, protection comes at the very forefront of our mine action programming? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. And uh, I think I'll turn it over to the panel. Would do you like to respond first, Christine? Um, thanks for the question. I think first and foremost, um, donor or donors can emphasize and put some requirements in place for the organizations receiving funding to maybe have targets and action plan and to actually work for reducing their impact um, and emissions and making sure that the projects they design are climate sensitive as well and the proper assessments are done. And I think also uh, we know there in general, we know there is a restriction on funding, uh, but I think there is an opportunity to a better coordinated approach maybe um, because uh, when we look into different initiatives now, we often see that the funding comes in different silence, either it's humanitarian, it's development or environmental funding. So maybe it's possible to look into bringing down kind of the silos there and um, joint initiatives to be able to deliver with more effectiveness as well. Yeah, so uh, basically also talk more to each other, I think will be helpful. Um, thank you very much for that question, and it is good that donors want to engage um, to help us all do better. And just mentioned, thinking uh, what Christian was saying, we can all remember when the gender marker came into being, um, and who knows what we could do there in terms of having, as you say, uh, some kind of environmental marker that would uh, encourage us all to really concentrate. And of course, the issue... Um, sometimes maybe it's going to cost more if we're going to be environmentally friendly i mean even in our personal lives things are uncomfortable but we at some point there is a cost to to what we're doing we have to be ready for that yeah i um i second what um Kristen and Abigail both said i think um, engagement is really important i can tell you that from the donor perspective I have learned so much about the environmental impact of operations from talking with our implementing partners. Um, when, when, for the, for example, the whole idea of um, scrap metal 
in PSSM operations. Um, that was raised to me by an implementing partner um, who, who was concerned about that and said that, that their organization was looking into that. So I think engagement is really important. Um, and as Abigail mentioned as well, uh, sometimes it becomes more costly. And I think we as a donor community have to accept that. Um, and the way I look at it is you are, you might be incurring a greater short-term cost, but the long-term benefit is greater. Um, so, you know, if we, if we ask our implementing partners to clear as much land as possible, as quickly and cheaply as possible, they are not going to be able to do it in an environmentally friendly way. And so we as a donor community have to accept that if we're putting the requirements on implementing partners to do something in an environmentally sustainable way, and we as a donor community should do that, then there will be additional costs. And, um, and I think that that's a worthy cost to bear. Thanks, Karen. Did, uh, I did my glasses on to read Palestine. Thank you. أولا بشكر المؤتمركم على النقاش في هذا الموضوع المهم. أنا بس حب إني أحكي كلمتين في هذا الموضوع إنه بخصوص موضوع الألغام تأثيرها على البيئة إنه في بلاد فلسطين يحصل الكثير في هذا الموضوع وفي هذا الشأن وهناك أمثلة على هذا الموضوع. إنه في قرية اسمها قرية الرشيد في بيت لحم الإسرائيليين خلال تدريباتهم العسكرية الجيش الإسرائيلي بيتركوا القنابل بيتركوا المت ال الذخيرة وقبل فترة تقريبا أشهر طفل فلسطيني حمل زي طابة فانفجرت فيه وتم إصابة أربع أطفال في هذا الموضوع. وأيضا في منطقة العكبة في محافظة طوباس برضو في مناطق في مناطق الألف وتس ألف وتسعمية وأربعة وستين يعني تاب على سبعة وستين هاي المناطق مناطق فلسطينية أيضا تم هناك إصابات في هذا الموضوع الإسرائيليين بتدربوا على أرضنا بقيموا معسكرات للجيش بتركوا هناك قنابل وذخيرة بتأثر على البيئة بتأثر على المحاصيل هناك يكون حرق للمحاصيل حرق المحاصيل لا يؤثر على البيئة الفل... على ال... على البيئة أيضا هناك إصابات وهناك حروق لل... للرعاة الفلسطينيين اللي بيسترزقوا في هاي المناطق إحنا تكلمنا في هذا الموضوع مع الهالو تراست وتكلمنا مع الإسرائيليين وتكلمنا أيضا مع ال... الأمريكان في هذا الموضوع وإن شاء الله هناك جهود إنهم يسمحوا لنا لأنهم مانعيننا أن نزيل هاي ال... الذخائر وهي الأجسام المشبوهة اللي, اللي موجودة في هاي المناطق واللي بتأثر على حياة المدنيين أولا وأيضا تؤثر على البيئة وأيضا تؤثر على رزق الفلاح الفلسطيني الذي يعتاش في هاي المناطق من خلال زراعة المحاصيل الزراعية إحنا حقول الألغام الموجودة بفلسطين هناك 15 حق الألغام موجود في الضفة الغربية الفلسطينية بمساعدة اليو أن ماس مشكورة اللي واقفة مع الفلسطينيين في هذا الموضوع وأيضا هالو تراست اللي احنا متعاقدين معها كوزارة الداخلية في السلطة الفلسطينية اقتربنا من إزالة 15 حق الألغام في الضفة الغربية وراح إن شاء الله خلال فترة قريبة نعلن الضفة الغربية فقط كمرحلة أولى خالية من حقول الألغام وذلك بتعاقدنا مع هالو تراست ويبقى 65 حق الألغام موجودات في منطقة الأغوار والحكومة الأردنية في منطقة الحدود الأردنية 65 حق الألغام أيضا سنشرع قريبا بإزالة حقلين راح يستمر إلى سنتين برضو مع هالو تراست الشكر اللي بدي أقوله لهالو تراست, لهالو تراست وأيضا لليو أن ماس اللي قاعدة بتساعدنا في موضوع التوعية في موضوع للجانب الفلسطيني اليو أن ماس دربت المركز الفلسطيني لمكافحة الألغام على موضوع التوعية أصبحنا من رواد في هذا الموضوع وأيضا أطلقنا كمركز فلسطيني تطبيق إلكتروني باللغة الفرنسية والإنجليزية والعربية لأعمار معينة لتوعيتهم من الألغام والأجسام المشبوهة وأيضا عملنا مجلة للبكم والصم وهي الأولى من نوعها في المنطقة ونشكر اليو أن ماس على هذا الموضوع 
وان شاء الله نضلنا على شراكه وشكرا لكم Thank you very much for that uh, intervention and comments from Palestine and uh, acknowledging uh, yeah, the impact of explosive ordnance contamination on the soil and uh, for land use as well and farming. And yeah, we really hope you can make use of the, the new IMAS when they do come in to incorporate that into addressing the contamination. Um, are there any other comments? Oh, Geneva Centre. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Christelle from uh, the GACHD. Uh, I would like to emphasize the importance of integrated environmental considerations in mine action. The panelists exposed very well the necessity, necessity to broaden our perspective and recognize the intersectionality of environmental concerns and humanitarian efforts. As part of the consultations for the climate change resilience study, that the GICH is conducting with the support of PMWRA, one challenge that has come up multiple times is the fact that mine action is often siloed and that there are limited interactions between NMAAs and other government ministries in charge of environmental issues and climate change. Christine mentioned earlier um, one possible solution to that, which would be to include mine action in national adaptation plans as part of countries' commitments to the Paris Agreement. My question would be, especially for national authorities, are there any other ways that mine action can better work with environmental actors, including relevant ministries, to make this a reality? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, maybe I'll pass that over to the floor, uh, Sasha. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. With us in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have a very good uh, communication with us ministries. Uh, you know, the Bosnia and Herzegovina is have three governments uh, in, in two entities, and uh, that uh, communication is very complicated. But uh, when we have uh, only months of meetings with uh, ministries, we are trying to, to, to say, people not the mining only to clean mines we are must thinking about people who is the return on that areas it's very important that the guys who is the people who is the return is have a uh, agricultural uh, uh, lands to, to, to live uh, bosnia is have a lot of um, woods and a lot of people is living about woods cutting tree and uh, all of, uh, industrial is very big hide from uh, uh, from that that industry of the of the debt i think it's uh, for for us in bosnia and herzegovina we have uh, very well communication about that and uh, it's not problem to me uh, give it a lot of answers from a question of the politics who is the we are see give it money from the mining from the owners uh, it's very important to me return people where we have good uh, opportunity for life. Thanks, Sasha. Did anybody else want to mention, or maybe as we're quite, we're running, uh, we've got five minutes left of this session, so maybe I can actually just turn it back to um, our panellists to mm -hmm. say a few words, uh, I guess a minute each maybe <laughs> on uh, Reflections just on the way forward for the sector in terms of uh, environment and climate change. Thanks. Thank you, Lucy. Just to, yeah, some uh, thoughts about this. And I think that everybody can do something when it comes to reducing the impact on the environment and climate. And initial steps are also positive and can lead to more engagement and action as well. And I think sharing best practices um, and discussing the environment and climate as we have done today and started with this week is really great. And also working in partnerships with environmental organizations to make sure that we have the necessary expertise to support the work and plans that we have. And also conduct pilots and learning from them uh, based on the needs from the communities. And I think it's 
this is about innovating the work we're doing and th a more holistic thinking. So um, we, it's important that we learn to make improvements as well. And uh, of course, just lastly, it has been mentioned several times, but uh, uh, with the revised IMA 713, I hope that this will be integrated into the national standards, which will be important. Thank you. Thank you. I think this has been a really um, important discussion today, and it's it's critical to me to incorporate environmental sustainability and resilience in all aspects of the clearance operations. Um, so this should involve discussions with national mine action authorities to include climate consideration climate considerations in their prioritization process, um, conducting clearance in a way that does not further harm the environment. And then working with communities and national authorities to ensure that land use after clearance is environmentally sustainable and beneficial within the context of local community needs, of course. Um, we know that humanitarian mine action has tremendous benefits to local populations. And traditionally, I think our, out, our focus has been on outputs, strictly outputs in, say, square kilometers that have been cleared. I think we need to look a little bit more holistically at outcomes from our clearance efforts um, and building in climate resiliency and environmental sustainability from the outset uh, can benefit not only the community immediately, but also the future generations. Yes, um, uh, I think it's this topic is must be on the table, uh, very on the na national authorities to see the, the mining is not only one action and one way. Uh, we are must talk about everything on the on the on the country, and for us it's very important that we have include this environment on the as standards and as procedures. To uh, we are have good results from return people on the that areas. Thank you. It's always a little tricky to be the last one to go with the <laughs> <laughs> concluding remarks. So I guess really what's struck me is this idea of practicing what we preach and we have individual responsibilities within the global picture. I mean, the, the UN, I've worked in lots of different UN missions and we have a, you know, Toyota Land Cruisers as far as the eye can see into the distance and there is a initiative in the UN called Greening the Blue, which is all about how we as an organization make ourselves greener and uh, yeah for UNMAS to be part of that and supporting that and uh, implementing that as our part of the of the uh, overall global effort. Um, we're committed to doing that and I think together we will make some difference. Thanks very much. Um, I guess uh, just wrapping up, just looking at mine action cannot wait as the, the theme of this NDM. And I guess we should add incorporating climate and the environment into mine action cannot wait. And we really hope that we're on an upward trajectory. Um, it's a really good start. We've got a lot of good things coming up. So we encourage you all to, to really look at it at every stage of operations before, during, after. It's relevant to national authorities, to donors, to clearance operators, the UN. So I'll just end by thanking uh, all the panelists uh, for today's session.